Good morning and welcome to PBIS for All, Strategies to Equitably Include Students with Disabilities in Tiered Behavioral su Supports, presented by Patricia Patty Shetter. I'm Celise Heron, Program Support Specialist, and I am thrilled to be your moderator for this breakout session. First, a few logistics. This session will be recorded and archived on the conference agenda page after the conference for one month. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button on the bottom right corner of the screen. The interpretation icon is in the same area and will provide access to Spanish translation. We will ensure the ASL interpreters are spotlighted along with the presentation and presenter. Please ensure your volume is muted to avoid background distractions while presenters speak. We encourage you to engage with others in the chat and when possible, keep your cameras on so we can see your wonderful faces. And with that, Patricia Patty Shutter. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Elise. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you all for um, attending and participating in this session on PBIS for All. Um, I'll start by just quickly um, introducing myself and telling you a little bit about um, me and how I came to be presenting this information to you today at the SIP conference. Um, I'm a program coordinator for the Placer County Office of Education. Um, coordinating our social, emotional, and behavioral um, supports uh, and programs. Um, one of the major initiatives um, out of Placer County is PBIS. We are a regional technical assistance provider for um, PBIS for Region 3, uh, which is the greater Sacramento area, um, providing lots of training, consultation, and support to districts within our catchment area. Um, my background is um, in primarily special education. I was a special education teacher and program specialist, uh, and I have a board certification in behavior analysis. So behavior's always been an interest and a passion of mine. Um, and of course, making sure that students with disabilities are being equitably supported and included um, in our school system is um, what it's all about for me. So Hopefully this presentation, um, all of that will come through for you. Uh, and hopefully you'll have some new strategies and thoughts and ideas about how to use some information uh, in, in regards to PBIS to support your students with disabilities more equitably. So I would love to <clears throat> just get a little sense of um, the audience and um, what you already know about PBIS. So this will be our first little chat activity. Um, in the chat, if you could uh, rate your sort of level of understanding or knowledge about PBIS on a scale of one, meaning not a lot of knowledge, to five, meaning I do PBIS all day, every day. I know everything about it. I could probably teach this course. Okay. So we have quite a range, it looks like, in the chat. Um, however, I see lots of fours, which tells me that there are a lot of you who are really in the throes of doing good implementation with this. Um, and I see um, quite a few twos and threes, uh, meaning uh, that sounds like you've had some exposure but want to learn more. And a few folks that um, are just beginning uh, to learn about PBIS and maybe don't know quite as much. So um, I will take that into consideration as I'm going through some of these examples and um, we'll leave you with some good resources. If you are more of a beginner um, in terms of your knowledge about PBIS, I'll give you some great resources where you can do a, a bit of a deeper dive. So what my objectives and what I'm hoping to be able to um, go over today, I'll review some of the PBIS core features and tiers of support. Um, and we're gonna review some of the research and data on students with disabilities and specifically um, how that relates to PBIS implementation. We're gonna explore some ways PBIS can assist with differentiated assistance and compliance and improvement monitoring and discuss some of the common myths about PBIS and students with disabilities. Um, I'll share some strategies for equitably including students with disabilities within your PBIS implementation and give you some opportunities to think about and plan for some next steps. 
So as I went through those objectives and as you're looking through A, at A through F there, um, what are one or two of the things that you as a participant in this are most interested in learning about or walking away with? You can enter it into the chat as a letter or a couple of letters. Okay. I see C. So exploring ways to assist in those compliance and improvement monitoring processes. Great, lots of C's and D's. Lots of E's, so tells me that people are really hungry for some strategies. Great. All right, some people interested in the research. Good, you've come to the right place. All right, great, thank you. That definitely helps me get a sense of what I should spend most of my time focusing on. So um, PBIS is basically the social emotional behavioral multi-tiered system of support framework. And if you're familiar at all with MTSS, but maybe haven't done a lot of PBIS, you probably know more than you think you do um, about PBIS and this framework and how um, it works and can be really effective. Um, the uh, visual on the left kind of shows the common features of both MTSS and PBIS. Um, I wanted to point out some of the characteristics and core features of PBIS um, as it relates to multi-tiered systems of support um, and some of the things that they have in common. The first is that PBIS focuses a great deal on developing systems. Um, so team-based processes are a, are a core feature and component of PBIS, just like they are with MTSS. Um, looking at teams at the district level who are coordinating the work, at the school site level who are really making sure that um, the practices and the data are being used um, effectively, that the professional development and coaching of the interventions are being done. Um, and that the right content expertise is being brought into teams um, when it's needed. Um, the second core feature of PBIS that's also common to MTSS is that there is a three-tiered continuum of culturally relevant evidence-based practices. Um, in PBIS, these practices are really centered on social, emotional, and behavioral um, learning and expectations. Um, whereas in a, in a more broad MTSS model, you might be looking at things like academics um, as well as social, emotional, and behavioral um, supports. And then a third core feature and component of PBIS that's also common to MTSS is the use of data. Um, in PBIS, um, data is used to inform practices. It's used to inform decision, uh, decisions about systems. Um, we don't just look at um, the outcome data or what's happening with students, but also what's happening with staff. Um, so are staff feeling supported in their use of the practices? Are they able to reach fidelity or do the things that um, the interventions or the practices that have been identified? Um, and data is also used to be able to help support and know when a student needs to receive something a little bit more or a little bit different. So PBIS um, is a multi-tiered system framework and the interventions um, are organized along that continuum of support with the universal prevention interventions um, being put in place for all students um, within a school site. Um, on the left, you'll see the common um, or the, the core universal prevention um, interventions that are part of PBIS. And they include things like uh, a common set of social, emotional, and behavioral expectations um, that are identified for the school site and are taught explicitly and repeatedly and are acknowledged through an acknowledgement system. There's also a universal continuum of responses to unwanted behaviors that are used and a common referral or request for assistance process where data decision rules are used in order to determine when a student might need to be referred for additional or supplemental supports and services. Um, PBIS also at the universal level really um, embodies and encourages relational engagement strategies 
um, so that school becomes a safe environment for all students that's predictable um, and and really um, you know meant to be a place of um, of support and safety. Uh, tier two, um, which are the targeted interventions, um, typically involve um, some type of supplemental support for students who are identified through those data decision rules um, or through screening or through referral. Um, these interventions are supposed to, supposed to be highly efficient and rapid um, in terms of students being able to access them and include things like uh, group skills teaching, um, social skills groups, academic skills groups, um, or performance-based interventions that support students in using the skills, but in the appropriate context. And those would be things like check-in, check-out, check-in connect, self-monitoring. Those are often the types of interventions that you see at that targeted level within PBIS. Um, it's important to know that those targeted interventions um, are often needed for about seven to 15% of the population. And just because a student is receiving a tier two intervention doesn't mean that they don't also have access to all of the good universal prevention supports that are available at tier one. It's supplemental to those tier one universal supports. And then at tier three, which is really intended to be um, reserved for that one to 5% of students who even with good tier one universal supports and good tier two interventions that have been implemented well um, and are meeting uh, that have been implemented well in an attempt to meet their needs. These are students that may need something a little bit more intensive, a little bit more individualized, um, things like a functional behavior assessment and behavior intervention plan, or a student-centered plan um, that looks at maybe some of those setting events or outside supports like wrap services um, that can help to be able to meet their more intense and individualized needs. So those core features of PBIS, many of which we just reviewed, but the systems, data, and practices have at their center a focus on equity. Um, and when these are being implemented at a school site, consistently and with fidelity. PBIS has demonstrated through um, years of research um, that we can see some really, really nice outcomes. Um, some of those improved student outcomes are increases in academic achievement, improved attendance, um, increased uh, emotional regulation and pro-social behaviors. And we see some ni nice outcomes in terms of bullying um, and in terms of things like drug use and alcohol use. We also see significant um, improvements and improved outcomes in terms of exclusionary discipline practices, reductions in things like office discipline referrals, suspension, restraint, seclusion, and some of those inequities um, around school discipline. Um, some of the equity outcomes um, are, are also really impressive and important to take note of. Um, and I highlighted the one at the bottom, um, which indicates that a student with a disability is 69% less likely to be referred to an alternative or more restrictive setting for discipline reasons on schools where PBIS is being implemented really well at that tier one level, those good universal interventions and supports. Um, so some great equity outcomes there that come along with PBIS implementation. Um, some additional documented and research-based outcomes for students with disabilities um, are improved social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. Um, you'll see those on the left, as well as um, a, a little bit more information about reduced exclusionary discipline. So why PBIS for students with disabilities? Why is it so important as we are planning for tiered interventions and we're thinking about social, emotional, and behavioral supports that we need to be really focused on and mindful of our students with disabilities? And I think the simple answer is because they're way more at risk. Um, they're way more at risk for um, suspension, expulsion, being referred to law enforcement, or being subjected to school-related um, arrests and encounters with law enforcement. 
Um, students with disabilities are more than five times as likely to be subjected to things like restraint and seclusion in our schools. In fact, when we look at that data on restraint and seclusion, the majority of students who are being subjected to um, these types of disciplinary um, and emergency responses are students with disabilities. Um, the other reason that we really need to focus on this is because unwanted behavior is the number one cited reason why students with disabilities aren't being included or are being referred to those more restrictive placements like non-public schools. Um, and it, it's the number one reason why they're not being uh, provided access to inclusive settings. So it's really fitting to kind of call this data out um, here at the at the SIP conference, um, because we're all here to be able to learn things that will help to support inclusive practices. And so what the data is telling us and um, what the, the indicators um, say is that PBIS is, when it's implemented, even just at tier one, is an inclusive practice. By using this as um, a way of, of doing your work, um, you are um, in essence setting up a context to include more students with disabilities in a more equitable way. So we'll show of hands. If you're on camera, you can just raise your hand or you can use the, um, the feature on your toolbar. How many of you are, is your district um, in DA for any issue related to students with disabilities. Seeing all kinds of hands, right? Um, we know that um, that this is a, a really common thing um, that our districts um, with this specific population, um, we tend to see higher um, and, and equitable rates of, um, of disciplinary actions, suspensions, um, and, and this is a common reason why districts are in DA for students with disabilities. Um, how many of you are in compliance and improvement monitoring or SIM, um, maybe around disproportionate discipline of students with disabilities? I'm seeing a few more hands on that. So I wanted to show you and give you some information about how PBIS can help to support with these issues. Um, so on this slide, you see um, all of the California eight state priorities. Um, these are the things that are supposed to be contained within the LCAP and are some of the reasons why um, you might be in differentiated assistance is um, for inequitable or low performance um, and lack of improvement in one of these eight priorities. So when we look at the, um, the studied outcomes of PBIS, all of which are indicated here, I wanted to show you how those align with those um, state priorities. So you can see that there's alignment at multiple places with the different state priorities. Um, and ultimately, all of these will result in um, the, big, the big indicator or the big priority, which is improved academic performance for students. Um, when we have good school climate, students feel safe, we have them attending more regularly with fewer disruptive behaviors, um, and we're building those social, emotional, and behavioral competencies. Um, we see all of these things um, are improved, um, including academic performance. Um, similarly, the alignment between um, the uh, APR indicators, which are the compliance and improvement indicators, which might result in you being in, um, in SIM for special education, PBIS also aligns with many of those indicators, um, and I've outlined them here for you so you can see um, what the research says can be improved and how that aligns with some of those indicators. And then, of course, just like um, with our uh, eight priority areas, um, that big outcome, um, indicator 14, improving post-secondary outcomes, um, the research on PBIS um, supports that. Um, that is one of the outcomes that we can expect when it's implemented. So given that PBIS um, is a multi-tiered system and um, that it's intended to be implemented on school sites to support uh, 
the social, emotional, and behavioral uh, development of all students. Um, I wanted to sort of explore a little bit about does all really mean all? Um, we have some data, uh, and this has been a, a, a pretty intense focus, I would say, over about the last five to 10 years um, in the, the PBIS um, sort of research realm. Um, we have some pretty clear data that reveal that students with disabilities, especially those with more extensive support needs, are consistently not included in PBIS. Um, and Thurlow um, and colleagues in 2020 made this statement. He said, when a group of students with disabilities is not included in an MTSS framework like PBIS is, the foundational concept of all students being general education students first with special education services supplementary is eroded. I know I'm preaching to the choir here at the SIP conference. Um, we all want all to mean all. Um, and so when we're thinking about PBIS implementation, um, this is something we really have to take a look at. So why is it? that students with disabilities aren't being included in PBIS implementation. What are your thoughts um, about the, that barrier? Um, why aren't they being included? Or what have you guys seen? I'd love to hear from some of you in the chat about this particular question. Why aren't we including our students with disabilities in PBIS implementation? Uh, so I see that Shannon shared that um, some educators might feel like it's bad parenting or they're bad kids, not enough training for staff. They're often regarded as being beyond the help that could be offered within PBIS. Great. Lack of administrative knowledge on the needs of students, specifically those um, with disabilities. Not the right fit in certain school settings. Okay. Lack of knowledge. Great. These are all really um, common reasons why um, people say students with disabilities aren't being included. Okay. Aaron said it's considered that they are not motivated by the same rewards as the other students. And so therefore maybe, maybe wouldn't benefit. Okay. Um, and then Chelsea said, people assume that if a kid is on an IEP, um, that basically their needs are being taken care of by the IEP. And so they, they, they must not need PBIS. Great. All right. So I mentioned that there's been a lot of research looking at this, um, the inclusion of students with disabilities in PBIS. Um, and so um, here are some of the things that in, um, in the research findings have shown um, as barriers to um, involvement of students with disabilities in PBIS. Um, these are the top four. Um, number one is negative perceptions about students with disabilities and or low expectations among school staff, aka ableism. Um, and if you've ever heard anyone speak about ableism, um, it is an ism. It's a, a set of beliefs that really um, are um, held by the individuals that are limiting to, um, to our students. And that's the number one cited reason in the research um, as, a, as a barrier to why educators aren't including students with disabilities in PBIS. The second is um, often there's limited resources and or administrative support for including students with disabilities in that PBIS framework. Limited training among staff. I saw several people in the chat mention um, that you felt like that was a, a common barrier. Um, and then the fourth is limited inclusive experiences for students with disabilities. So that tendency to have students um, especially with more um, extensive support needs um, in self-contained programs or referring them to, um, to other 
uh, school sites um, or other types of programs um, where PBIS isn't maybe a part of um, what's happening on that campus. Um, those limited inclusive experiences may prevent students from being um, able to participate in PBIS. Okay. There are also a lot of common myths about PBIS um, and students with disabilities. Um, the first one that is cited is that PBIS is a general education system um, and not a benefit for students with disabilities or those receiving special education services. Okay? That's a myth. We saw the research. The research clearly says students with disabilities benefit even at tier one levels when that's being implemented and they're being included, um, they derive benefit. So that myth is, um, is, is just that, it's a myth. Um, the data doesn't say that that is true. The second is that special education services replace PBIS. It is their tier three set of services. Um, and certainly the services um, and the IEP goals that a student who has an IEP might receive may be intensive and they may be individualized. It's the reason why they um, probably require an IEP. But just because a student has an IEP doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to the general education program. Um, and if PDIS is being implemented, it's part of the general education um, program supports and services. So the IEP should supplement. Um, it should support that individual um, above and beyond or in addition to what's already being offered to, um, to general education students on that campus. Um, the third myth, PDIS cannot or should not be implemented in alternative settings. So a lot of people have that belief or, or think that, well, you can't implement PDIS in a special day classroom um, or in a court and community school or um, in a non-public school, um, but that's a myth. It can and is being and has been very successfully implemented in alternative settings. Now, granted, you have to adapt it a little bit to fit the context. The universal interventions that take place, for example, in an autism special day classroom or an autism non-public school, um, those universal interventions that everyone gets, uh, that tier one might look a little different than if it was in a general education classroom. But the majority of those students, if they could benefit from um, for example, a visual schedule, um, and that's a universal support that everyone is gaining access to. It certainly can be implemented in um, that highly specialized or alternative setting. And then myth number four, students cannot be in, students with disabilities cannot be included in the PBIS data system. I hear this one a lot. Um, you know, they have such frequent behaviors or they have such unique behaviors that we really can't um, capture them in our data system or, oh, I love this one, or they'll skew our data. That one makes me crazy. Um, so it's, it's like there's this assumption, right, that you've got this pyramid that the top is the special ed part, right? And, and that perception that we can do universal and maybe some targeted with our general education students, but that top of the pyramid, that's special education, that's those kids. Um, and th these are all myths that the research and the data and our practical experience show us um, are, are absolutely not true. Yes, thank you. I see, uh, is it, so, so he said it's to uh, supplement, not to supplant. Very good, yes. All right, so I know a lot of you are really interested in, in this portion of the presentation, um, and that's how do we help make PBIS work for all? What are the ways that we can, what are the strategies that we can use in order for this to really be a more inclusive practice and benefit um, all or more students? Um, and the answer is that we really need to think about and focus first at that tier one universal level. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, these are the core systems features of tier one PBIS. And on the right-hand side are um, some of the core practices that are part of Tier 1 PBIS. And I'm going to focus this first on the left-hand side, 
the systems features of PBIS. Um, so leadership team that represents multiple and diverse perspectives um, are available to co-create the systems that are taking place. That's systems feature, core feature number one. That team has regular monthly meetings that are structured and linked to the school improvement plan. There's a commitment statement um, for establishing a positive school-wide social, um, social culture. Procedures for ongoing data-based monitoring, evaluation, and dissemination are um, committed to and used. And then there's a procedure for selection, training, and coaching of new personnel on PBIS and the evidence-based tier one practices. So those on that, that left-hand side are the systems features. So I wanna give you guys an opportunity in the chat to think about just that first one. From a systems perspective, who would be important to include on the tier one PBIS leadership team on a campus? to help ensure that PBIS is being implemented and that it's effective for students with disabilities? Who would make sense to include? Maybe paraprofessionals who work with those students every day and know them really well, yeah. Special education teachers, 100%. And you know what? It's a little known secret, but special education teachers actually have lots of really good practices that can work for all students. <laughs> all right, someone in special education, yes. BCBAs, school psychologists, yeah. Those school psychologists also have some really, really great strategies um, in their tool belts that when applied more universally, when we can tap into their knowledge and expertise as part of tier one, Oh, I love it, Melanie, thank you. Parents, absolutely. And not just um, not just the parents that are always showing up and being invited to do things, but parents who have that unique perspective um, of uh, students who are often left out and marginalized like our students with disabilities. Great. Yeah, so just thinking about a change a suggestion, a small element that could really impact the inclusion of students with disabilities in your PBIS systems is working on getting some people with special education expertise and knowledge and lived experience on those tier one PBIS teams. And I, there, there's a saying, and I can't remember where I heard it, but it, I, it always resonates with me. Um, if there's not a chair at the table, go get a folding chair and pull it up. <laughs> so we have to make our voices heard and our knowledge um, uh, and expectation um, at the, that tier one level. And just that systems feature and that change alone could make a huge impact. How about this second one? Procedures for ongoing data-based monitoring, evaluation, and dissemination. So this is a question that I, I often ask teams. How is data um, on students with disabilities being included in the data-based decision-making? And are students who maybe are on a campus but in a, a self-contained program um, or spending part of their day in um, a, a resource um, type of situation. Um, are those students being counted in the school-wide data collection system? I'm gonna come back to that towards the end and give you guys some additional thoughts and, and time um, to, to think about that one. Um, but it's, it's an important consideration um, and we shouldn't be afraid that it's going to skew our data. That information needs to be used for some database decision making. And I'm going to circle back to that um, in just a minute. Um, and then the third systems feature, procedures for selection, training, and coaching of new personnel. It's a question. Are special education staff, paraeducators, and um, DIS providers included in the PBIS training and coaching opportunities. Do they get invited? Because if they're not even being invited, then that's someone's assumption that 
they aren't going to be able to benefit. And sometimes that assumption goes both ways, right? Sometimes we hear from special education teachers, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Um, but in actuality, it does, and it can, um, and it should, uh, because we know that PBIS, when implemented in those specialized contexts, can have the same really awesome results for students. Uh, Alex said, yeah, mm, schools within schools. Nope, they are not being counted. Ooh, they are not being counted. Ouch. All right, so I'm going to make a shift. I'm making a shift over here to the practice side, and I'm going to walk you guys through some um, small tweaks, changes, strategies to think about at the tier one universal level um, for being able to more equitably include and support students with disabilities um, in your PBIS practices. So the first one we're going to talk about is the set of school-wide positive expectations and social emotional behavioral skills that are being defined and taught. This is a core practice in tier one PBIS. And so typically this is what it looks like. The, the school determines or identifies between three to five, five or fewer, positively stated social emotional expectations and breaks it down by um, the um, location or the context in which the behavior would be demonstrated. So in this example for uh, Amnesty Elementary School, um, the three expectations that they have are, we are respectful, we solve problems, and we make good decisions. And then you can see on this matrix that there's more specifics broken down by the context. So what it means on the play structure, the blacktop and the field to be respectful is that we take turns, we allow anyone who wants to play to play, and we use the equipment correctly. Okay, so broken down a little bit more specifically, these are the expectations, but they're consistent and they're spelled out. And in good tier one PBIS, these are taught and practiced and rehearsed and acknowledged by all staff on the campus with all students on the campus, okay? Um, they're also typically posted visually, like what you see here, um, on posters um, in the various locations uh, across the campus. So they can be referenced, they're used as a reminder for staff and for students of what the expectations are, and hopefully they're being referenced whenever students are needing to be reminded or redirected um, to the expectations or whenever they're being acknowledged or rewarded. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about acknowledgement in just a minute, but this is sort of the basics. Um, so here's a question for you. And one thing that um, could really dramatically improve things. Um, what if we added an expectation okay, to those three that you saw before? What if we added a fourth expectation that was we are inclusive on your campus? We're safe, we're respectful, um, we're, um, we're uh, responsible and we are inclusive. What do you think that would do to the culture of the school site? So I have an example here. We are inclusive. Let's say that was our fourth expectation for Amnesty Elementary. Um, and we could spell it out in the cafeteria. What does that expectation look like? What does it mean? Maybe it means we understand that some kids may be overwhelmed by the noise and need a quiet place, or maybe they need to wear earphones. That could be what that looks like. We are inclusive in the cafeteria by understanding those individual differences and preferences, and, and we're not going to make fun of them. We're going to honor them. We're going to be inclusive of those students um, and their preferences. Okay. So I want to ask you guys, to apply this and think about, if you had an expectation we are inclusive, what might those expectations of being inclusive look like on the playground? 
You can type your ideas or your thoughts in the chat. Stasia asked if you could get a copy um, of these slides. Um, absolutely, I'm happy to share them. Um, I'm not sure if they're available through the website, but um, I can I can certainly make sure that that you guys get copies of these. All right. So Aaron says in the cafeteria um, we can sit quietly with those kids so that they don't have to sit alone. Yes, that's a great expectation or example of being inclusive. We can change and adapt the games so that everyone can play. I love that. Okay, Melanie gave a, a great example of a way of being inclusive, um, it, allowing a student to hold an end of a jump rope um, on the playground. Maybe they don't jump rope. Um, if they're in a wheelchair, but they can still participate. So maybe the expectation is we find ways for everyone to be included based on their abilities. Love that. Oh, Alyssa, good one. We make sure to have equipment that all students can access. Great. Okay. Now remember that these expectations in PBIS are for staff and students. So thinking about we are inclusive, um, having available equipment that works for or is accessible to all students um, is a really important adult expectation. What will the adults on campus do to make sure that we can honor this expectation and this commitment to being inclusive? Awesome. Just by adding this as one of the three to five um, expectations on a campus, um, you can really get a lot of traction and have some really important conversations um, about inclusion, about universal design for learning, about what it means to be inclusive, not only with students and teaching them about inclusivity, but also the adults on a campus um, and holding them accountable um, to that expectation. Great. Um, I had a couple of examples um, myself there just to reference. Um, we are inclusive in the classroom makes, uh, means to that we make sure everyone has what they need to learn. And we are inclusive on the playground. We ask new friends to play and give everyone a chance. Great. Oh, Deborah, thank you. Um, she put a link to the slides up there in the chat for y'all. All right. So next, what can we do with those school-wide expectations in order to make sure that um, we're being more inclusive and including students with disabilities? Well, we can apply universal design for learning principles, of course. Um, I know that you all probably have lots of expertise and knowledge about universal design for learning, um, but in case you're new to it, um, UDL, um, really is intended to um, resolve the barriers in the design. Um, and so it's thinking about what's the barrier in the system or in the practice um, that's a barrier and not thinking about a barrier as being in a student. So we intentionally plan for variability um, and Think about ways in which um, we can eliminate the barriers from, um, from the context and from the, the systems um, rather than thinking about them being um, inherent in the student. So I know I've got some UDL experts out there in the audience. So you remember that poster I showed you before with Amnesty and there are three expectations and it had it broken down by the location and it had the the sub skills or rules for each um, scenario listed out. Um, these are posters that are based on school-wide expectations as well, but they've been UDL'd in some way, shape or form. So what are some things that you're seeing that are representative aspects of UDL on these posters, 
on these expectations. Carolyn said the use of visuals. Yeah, the use of visuals. You can see on the left that simply adding an icon, an iconic representation of what those words are. Now that's gonna make it more accessible and meaningful for lots of students, not just students with disabilities. Maybe our young kids who are emerging readers. Okay, maybe students who are learning English and aren't yet able to read the words and make meaning of them quickly. Okay. On the right-hand side, there's also visuals. Um, the, the visuals are also um, really representative of the students on that campus. In fact, ideally, these are pictures of students from that campus, because now I can identify with the pictures of the people on that poster. Um, and they're real photos, which are also more accessible to students with variable learning um, and uh, probably quite a bit more meaningful than even the iconic representation that you see on the left. Okay, short examples, yes, lessen the language, make it concise, different size fonts, yeah, make it big enough to where people can see. The QR codes, um, those are um, can be linked to either a video model of that expectation or to it in um, a different language. Um, if you have students who um, whose primary language is something other than English um, or families who are on the campus whose uh, language may be something um, other than English, that makes it more accessible to them as well. Okay, so thinking about the expectations and thinking about how those expectations are being represented visually um, on those posters, applying universal design for learning to just that element is gonna make the PBIS expectations way more accessible. Um, another thing that, that can and should be done um, is offering multiple ways uh, for students to express their understanding of the social emotional behavioral expectations. Um, one of the things for those of you who are familiar with PBIS, um, whenever a, a school is doing their annual fidelity assessment using the tiered fidelity inventory, that's the fidelity assessment for PBIS, um, someone walks around the campus and asks students to tell them, what are your school-wide expectations? And the, the school gets points um, towards fidelity if students can recite and tell about the expectations. So how do we make that an option and accessible to students who maybe aren't vocal, who communicate alternative, using alternative methods? Um, so making sure that those expectations are a part of the communication options and they're being taught using that student's primary communication modality. Um, and you see some examples of that over on the left. Um, on the right-hand side, multiple ways of expressing understanding about those expectations. Um, students can demonstrate that they understand expectations in a lot of other ways besides just reciting them. Um, Role-playing, acting them out, um, or you see a couple of examples of um, picture drawings of the expectations and a student demonstrating they understand what they are um, through, um, through drawings. Okay, so opening up and thinking more about ways to help students demonstrate or show what they know. When expectations are being taught, we also want to be thinking about multiple uh, means of engagement. So typically in PBIS Tier 1, um, a lesson plan is written for how the expectations are going to be taught, and it uses a sort of typical um, pedagogy of I do, we do, you do. Okay, I'm going to model it for you. I'm going to demonstrate some examples and maybe some non-examples, and then I'm going to have you demonstrate it, and then we're going to work on it, and I'm going to reinforce you doing it when I see it um, in real life on the campus um, using the acknowledgement system. Not all learners learn best that way, though. Um, we have variability in how students engage in learning and what makes it motivating and meaningful to them. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, on the right-hand side um, is the use of an evidence-based practice called social narratives. You might know them as social stories. Um, it's a way of being able to teach skills in a very concrete, visual way um, that typically includes 
um, something meaningful and motivating to the student. So I think Mario is a great example. Um, the, the student or student groups that this particular social narr narrative was developed for um, are very into uh, Super Mario and um, that character is used to be able to engage them in learning about and remembering the expectation. Um, so there's lots of different ways that this can be done. It makes it very meaningful um, and, and engaging to the students. Um, and then that social story can then in turn be used as a reminder or a prompt or a redirect um, whenever the student might need some additional support with remembering. Um, I'm not gonna be able to show the whole thing, but I did wanna show um, on the left-hand side um, a, a video demonstration or a video model that was created um, for a group of students um, who have more significant um, disabilities and support needs. Um, around their school-wide expectations. And I apologize that you're probably gonna be singing this song in your head the rest of the day, but that just goes to show you how um, engaging and meaningful that this can be. We cannot hear the sound. It's just music. You can't hear it at all? Not really, no. I can have the same question that I want to. I'll communicate the cabin. I can follow routines like that. What do you see? Am I learning? I can have the same question in the classroom. I can have the same body in the hall. I stay to the body for the one side, which is funny and Everybody can get home. I can have the same body in the nursing or in the cafeteria. I respect your respect. I will not take your chicken nuggets or pizza. Okay, you get the idea. Um, so they took a song and they added the expectations and they taught the students some simple movements that matched the expectations. Um, they videotaped them demonstrating it. And this is used not only to teach um, the, the expectations, but also um, as the way of sort of reteaching and reminding. Um, and those universal symbols or um, uh, gestures and movements that they use all the staff on the campus knew what they were so they could provide them when needed. So I'm gonna move pretty quickly through um, a couple more of the core features because I know that we're starting to get a little bit low on time. Um, a, a second core practice at tier one are acknowledgement systems. Um, and this is basically how after a skill is taught, um, we're rewarding students um, and calling them out on engaging in the appropriate behaviors. Um, and oftentimes what you'll see on a campus that's implementing PBIS are these things called acknowledgement tickets or school bucks. Um, these are a few different examples um, of those. We can uh, make this um, very meaningful to students with disabilities um, and really more students in general um, by engaging them in things like preference assessments, getting their input on what those acknowledgement tickets can be exchanged for, um, and individualizing perhaps some of the opportunities um, for exchanging if um, the typical school-wide rewards aren't that meaningful for them. We can do a little bit of supplementing here um, so that they are more meaningful. Um, Behavior-specific praise with acknowledgement is also really important. Uh, and I have a, a quick video I want to show you of my friend Christy Carr, um, who's up in Butte County, and they're doing an awesome job of implementing PBIS with their students with more significant disabilities. Um, and uh, 
she'll show you really quickly the way that they are able to do this on this video. Hopefully you guys can see it and hear it. So um, we have gestures for being safe, be responsible, and being kind so that all students have access to sharing information through our, whatever communication means they have. So it's only be safe, be responsible, and be kind. Oh, we're so that lanyard has the visuals, they can access it anywhere at any time. And then they've also added those gestures and all the staff know them and use them in order to give students specific praise. Um, another quick and easy way of being able to engage students in that school-wide acknowledgement system, even if they're on their own individual token system, make the tokens align with whatever the school-wide acknowledgement system is. <clears throat> So this is an example um, where the school buck is the typical acknowledgement system, but this particular student has their own individual token system where they're earning tokens more regularly, but that symbol is the same on their token system as it is for the school-wide acknowledgement system. We may need to bump up or intensify the amount of acknowledgement that we give from the typical five to one to something like nine to one or add some additional choices and things like choice boards um, to the acknowledgement system so our students understand that school buck gets traded in for things that are really important and meaningful to me. All right, um, the last core feature that I'm gonna um, spend some time talking about is the um, continuum of responses to unwanted behaviors. Um, so typically in tier one PBIS, there's a continuum of responses that are outlined so that teachers know what to do when a student starts to engage in an unwanted behavior. And what I would ask is that the special education support person on that tier one team um, look at what that continuum is and help people understand that some of those kind of typical low level responses to unwanted behavior Things like physical proximity, nonverbal cues, the eye, you know, the teacher look, the eye contact, like, come on now. Um, they require some skills that sometimes our students with disabilities uh, may not yet possess. So requiring an understanding of nonverbal communication, there's a lot of students who are gonna miss those kinds of redirects um, or lower level responses to unwanted behaviors. Um, so make sure that, that those are really being considered and thought about. And an easy fix for that is um, incorporating just um, more visuals that can be used to represent um, and redirect students and pre-teach um, into, into the, the repertoire. So you see on the left over there, there's some that are posted that can be easily torn off the Velcro and referenced, um, keychains or on the lanyard like you saw with Christy, um, just making those um, a bit more accessible. All right, I told you I was gonna circle back um, thinking about discipline data and why it's so important to include our students with disabilities in that data, because that data really should um, result in um, good tier one interventions being implemented for students that need them. And it should result in students who are in need of something more or something a little bit um, more specific, um, getting access to those interventions. Um, so I have a challenge for you as we sort of wrap this up today. Um, if you're working on a school site that's implementing PBIS, um, go back and talk to um, your team, your tier one team, and figure out ways of being able to include your students, not only in your data collection systems, but especially in your tier one implementation. If this was just a little taste and you want more, um, I wanted to let you know that we'll be doing a full day pre-conference workshop on this very topic. Um, uh, our folks from Placer County, County are partnering with um, our folks from Butte County. We're gonna be doing a workshop on equitably including all students within PBIS um, at the PBIS conference in Sacramento. Um, please come and join us if you wanna learn more um, the two resources I've included are available and are downloadable for free on the PBIS um, and the Thai Center website. And hopefully I have given you some um, ideas of even just small tweaks that you can use to make your PBIS 
more accessible to students with disabilities, um, or at least some talking points to take back to have some conversations with your PBIS teams. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Patty. That was amazing information. Thank you everyone to who attended um, for your commitment to our students with disabilities and their families. It is our mission to accelerate our educational system to innovate, include, and impact outcomes positively for all, from birth to childhood and beyond. The presentations, slides, and resources can be accessed in the session description section on the VFAIRS agenda page. If you have any additional questions, please head to the information booth and you may find your answers there. Be sure to join us inclusion tune up with DJB Diamond and the next session will start at 1110 AM. Also connect with other attendees in the social lounge to stop and take a selfie in the photo booth. Don't forget to share your socials and tag at SIP inclusion with the hashtag hashtag SIPCon 2024. Thank you guys for being here and have a wonderful afternoon.